Good morning. Welcome to July 4th. The title of our sermon is The Guilt of America. It's an Independence Day sermon. If you open your Bibles to Psalms 33, we'll be reading from that today. With all her faults, America is still the greatest place on earth to live. She's great in beauty, but that's not what makes her great. Great for her freedoms. Real trend today in America for anti-Americanism, anti-patriotism. The UN is doing much to strip us of our sovereignty, to revise history and to undermine the character and integrity of our founding fathers, saying they weren't who we know who we know they were. They say they weren't motivated by principle but by poverty. We're motivated by greed and desire for wealth. That's not true. The men who signed the Declaration of Independence had far more to lose than to gain. Most were very wealthy already. Twenty-four were lawyers and such. Nine were, law were landowners or rich farmers. Eleven were merchants. The others were physicians, ministers, politicians, etc. All but two who signed had families. They were educated men of standing in their communities. They knew security and prosperity, but felt there was nothing, there was something more imped than security, freedom. They knew that the penalty for treason was death by hanging, yet they signed. John Hancock signed twice as large as all the others. Now his, his majesty can read my name without his spectacles, he said. Stephen Hopkins he was old when he signed. He said his hand shook as he signed, looked up and said, Gentlemen, my hand trembles, but my heart does not. Four delegates from New York were particularly wealthy British ships were, were particularly wealthy. British ships were nearing just a few miles off the coast when they signed. Most of New York had already evacuated. They and others were pursued. Some were captured and tortured, and of course many died. Young people, you need to know when you look at this flag that these red stripes and bars of blood, a price paid for you to be free. And when young people today burn the flag in ignorant demonstrations, it's not freedom of speech, it's high treason against the land, and of the land of the free and the home of the brave, and should be prosecuted as well. Thanks for the greatness of America, great for her freedoms. Just as the revolutionists wanted to rewrite history in order to undermine the character and integrity of our founding fathers, they also want to undermine our, God, our godly heritage. They try to tell us that this nation wasn't really founded upon God. We can't, why can't some Americans accept their roots? Even the South, African, South American president years ago said, People came to my continent looking for gold, but those who came to America were looking for God. In 1620, the first pilgrims arrived. A little band of people crossed the Atlantic in a sailboat 26 by 113 feet. They landed on the Atlantic coast in a bitter cold of winter. As they stepped off the boat, they signed a compact. The second paragraph of which begins, For the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith, the first winter was rough. At times, the daily ration of food was five grains of corn per person per day. Forty-four died in the first five months, and fifty-eight survived. In the fall of 1621, they reaped their first harvest, twenty-one acres of corn. They, their immediate response was to thank God. They marched through the cornfield singing, the earth is the Lord, and fulfillness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. December 13th, those 58 gathered with 80 friendly Indians and celebrated three days of thanksgiving, which the encyclopedia records as three days of preaching, praying, singing, and eating. Check your kids' textbooks, most of which say the pilgrims and Indians met to thank each other. No, to thank God. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln proclaimed a, na proclaimed a national Thanksgiving Day. In his proclamation, he made an important and accurate theological point. 
We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth and power, as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in the peace and multiplied in the enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to God that made us. The Puritans, they gave their reasons for coming to America as well. In the opening sequence of the, of the Northeast Confeder Confederation, it says, Whereas we all came into these parts of America with one and the same end, an aim to advance the kingdom of, the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel and liberty and peace. Benjamin Franklin once challenged about having a political session open with prayer said, I've lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of his truth, that God governs the affairs of men, and if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that the empire can rise without his aid. We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings, that except the Lord build the house they labor, in vain who built it. Some Christians have been intimidated and they've heard the ACLU talk so much about the separation of church and state that they've actually started to believe in it. In case you didn't know, the phrase never appears in the Constitution. However, it is found, on a, of a, it is found in Karl, Mark, Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. It was coined in the U.S. from a letter the principal framer of the Constitution and third president Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist Association assuring them that he would keep the government out of the church, not the church out of the government. He was saying never again will there be a government sponsored church like you had back in England where everyone is forced to attend and support. Check it out for yourself. The First Amendment actually says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Is there such a thing as a, a separation of church and state? It is intended as a one-way street. Some say no. They wanted to keep both separate. Well, let's think about that. Our first president, George Washington, took the oath of office and put his hand on what? The Bible. What was his first official act as president? Kiss the Bible, then held a two-hour praise and worship session in Congress. How did, he de how did he determine the open sessions of Congress? Prayer. Who would lead in those prayers? Chaplains. How would they be paid? Tax dollars. Does all of that sound like they wanted to keep God out of government? By the way, opening in prayer is a mystery to investigate. Why is it that the little boys and little girls cannot in, can, cannot in school, but the big congressmen can? Who decided to put in godly trust on our coins? It was adopted by Congress in 1956. In 1776, 11 of the 13 colonies required that one had to be a Christian to be eligible to run for political office. These are all true facts. In 1777, the Continental Congress voted to spend $300,000 to purchase Bibles for distribution in the nation. The Gettysburg Address states, This nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. 94% of the writings on, of the Founding Fathers on the US contain, of the U.S. contain quotations from the Holy Scriptures. The state constitutions of all 50 states mention God. The famous Liberty Bell has part of Leviticus 